All right, welcome, welcome everybody to our 18th um, Back to the South study course uh, meeting, I think. Uh, so again, th this is the um, this is the course that we're doing in preparation for our return to our collective cells in uh, 2021, hopefully. And our, the purpose of this session is um, principally to look at things that we often miss um, when uh, we're at the cell on the floor. Uh, there is often, like I say every week, there's often a large distance between what is on the floor. Uh, what is consumed by students on the floor and what is um, in the manuscript. And this is because when we're training, when we're down to the business of training, um, there's not a lot of time, right? Every class is a rush. There's so much to do and so little time. And we have to attempt to um, not only disseminate, but practice the material that's presented in Fiore's book um, in only a super short uh, time so you know we don't get a chance to uh, reflect onto the manuscript very much much less all of the interesting niceties and elements of it so this is a great opportunity for us to take some time to read the manuscript and to get to know it a little better if we weren't doing so already and ask questions and um, also kind of see where some of the stuff we see on the floor comes from if we were weren't exactly sure um, I, as uh, free scholar Aaron Bolarino, am principally leading this examination of Fiore. So um, by necessity, you're getting principally my view on a lot of things. But like I um, say every weekend and truly mean, my view is just one of many. And uh, there's a wealth of really interesting opinion and um, scholarly work at Emma that it is extremely um fruitful uh, to know, right? It's not sufficient in scholarship just to know one person's view, even if they're the person you think is right. There's, um, far, there's a far deeper understanding available of the manuscript to students who take the time to cultivate a knowledge of the different views of others and find the interesting counterpoints and debates uh, between the two. Um, and lastly, of course, if there's anything that I do claim in these uh, sessions, of course, it's my opinion. And uh, I would not want you to believe something is so just because I said it or rather anyone else. Uh, I would want you to be convinced by the same evidence that I'm convinced by. Any questions you may have, uh, it's likely that other people have them as well. So this is a great time for those of you on the stream to ask questions. Um, about anything that we, we we come across, there's no dumb questions whatsoever. Um, this is what we're we're here to do. Okay, and with um, all that said, let's uh, let's get into it. <clears throat> so, uh, my God, we're in Stretto. My God. Okay, so for another week, we're still going through the sword in two hands section uh, in the Getty by my. Um, calculation it begins relatively speaking at folio 22 ra in the getty starting with the collection of um with, with two collections of guards then we have some cuts then a little preface section and then largo stretto and then a final master so we're on the stretto section today which begins with folio 27 vd in the getty And um, I guess for one last time, uh, the difference between Largo and Stretto for us is sufficient to say, uh, or t it's sufficient for us to lean on the sort of colloquial, conventional um, understandings of Largo and Stretto. That being, Largo is long play, loose play, wide play, unconstrained play, broadly speaking, at the tips of the sword. Um, or perhaps as low as um, engagement middle to middle. And Largo is the kind of fancy uh, ting, ting, tingy, ting kind of fencing that you think of when you think of, I suppose, um, you know, a classic idea of sword fighting. Errol Flynn in uh, uh, The Adventures of Robin Hood, uh, as an example. <laughs> if, any, if any of you don't, uh, I don't know what that movie is, please leave my stream right now and go watch it. Please. 
right this instant. Go watch it. Also, reach uh, watch Robin and Mary with Sean Connery. Oh, yes, money, Penny. I mean, Marion. Um, but of course, all of you have seen all those those movies. Of course, that's what drew you to Emma. So, um, Stretto, on the other hand, um, Stretto is conventionally understood as close play, um, constrained play, um, play which uh, play with with swords that often right. ends in, uh, in 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 grappling of some kind, in, in entries. Uh, what would you say there, Kel? Arrow play. Narrow play. There you go. Narrow play. Thank you. Yeah. So that's what we're uh, about to begin to deal with today. Um, so we spent a, a good deal of time dealing with Largo over the last number of weeks. Broadly speaking, when we we're looking at the things that Fiore talks about to us in the Largo section, we looked at how to deal with cuts in the first more or less half of the section. And then how to deal with uh, thrusts, things you can do against thrusts in the second half of the section. But with a couple entries, um, we have some blade grabs here. We have some interesting things to do with legs here. We have some neat um, moves like the doing something against a peasant strike or um, a, little, uh, a little grappling entry or a false point. We had a whole bunch of stuff in here. But broadly speaking, we're talking about defenses against... Uh, thrusts, uh, thrust, uh, thrusts, <laughs> thrusts, and and against cuts, and most notably in in Largo, we begin began the section with um, looking at situations in a Largo setting where the engagement. When I say engagement, what I mean is the when the swords first touch. When the engagement of the sword was at the tips, was at the first third of the blade and when the engagement was at the middle of the blade. And we spent a lot of time talking about tempo and the logic of fencing, um, and also how the place of engagement matters um, in Largo to tell you what you can do, what you can't do, what you have time to do, what you don't have time to do, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this is um, sort of prelude to us going back to uh, Something that we're actually more familiar with, having read Fiore. Now, Stretto, as we know, as I said, we're going to be talking about a lot of entries and whatnot. While it's true that we got a primer about kind of swords working at their most sort of natural in the Largo section, we got a far larger primer about Stretto in the first two sections of the book. We spent a lot of time, of course, 16 plays worth of grappling at the beginning of the book, along with a significant introduction to uh, grappling in Fiore's preface, what makes a good fighter, the qualities they need to have, what the kind of abrazare that is in this book is, you know, it's abrazare for life, not for play, and et cetera, et cetera. And then we saw all of that again in the context, uh, in the context of the dagger. So we've seen far more to date to this point in the book having started at the very beginning, we've seen far more, I guess, uh, by weight, plays involving uh, Abrazarian entries, as it were, than we have swordsmanship, uh, classically speaking. So going into Stretto, we have two things to draw on. We have two main sources of experience. We have the Largo section and some things that we've learned from the sword in one hand section. And we also have all of the things that we have learned from Abrazare and Dagger. And why this is important to remember is that we ought not, I uh, submit to you, we ought not approach this section as if it's something new. It ought to be, if we've paid attention so far in the book, it ought to be likely, not having looked at any of it, it ought to be likely mostly things that we've already seen or at least can recognize as things that, you know, they look like things we've done previously in dagger and wrestling, or or maybe they look like something that we've seen in sword. Okay, so the strato section is a way, therefore, to kind of help you not only prove to yourself, um, but to others that you've been paying attention to the book up until this point, right? Because strato puts it all together. There is a sword here. Swords are absolutely part of this, but we're going to be wrestling. Uh, we're going to be doing abrazare too. 
So it's kind of, uh, it's, it puts it all together. And circumstantially, after, well, we'll get to this Boris Toothmaster in a, uh, after this section, but this will be um, very brief, uh, albeit interesting for us. Right after Stretto is over, uh, Fiore's book in the Getty has the Segno page. And after that, all of the sections are in armor. Sword in armor, axe in armor, spear in armor, mounted combat, uh, although it's not obvious that all of these are in armor. But my point is, oh, except we have this dagger, spear, and club section. I forgot. That kind of slipped my mind. There you go. How sneaky. But my point is, is that we're in very kind of nearly leading up to what seems like to be the crescendo of the first half of the book. This dagger, spear, and clubs uh, section is very interesting and unique, but it's not obvious that it sums up, as it were, uh, everything that's come before in the way that kind of Stretto does. So this is just to kind of build up what I uh, to, to anticipate what we're looking at. Um, we're looking at, I think, something that sums up everything that we've studied to date, which is pretty interesting and neat in and of itself. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Folio 28 RA, the first play of Stretto. All right. Um, Bruce, would you like to read this text for us? <clears throat> Second edition. We have crossed our swords. This is the crossing from which we can make all the plays that follow. Both of us could perform each of them. These plays will follow one another, as I have explained above. Thank you very much, Bruce. All right. So the first play of Stratto. Um, so Fury here, um, conventional wisdom, I believe, is to understand this first master as explaining the setup for the whole best of the section. I believe this is the only master in Stretto and the Getty. I think that's right. There's a countermaster in there. Um, there's a couple countermasters, but it's the only master, yeah. The counter and a counter contrary. That's right, that's right, that's right. So being the only master, um, I, the conventional wisdom I believe is that this is the setup for all the plays that follow in the rest of the section. And so what we're looking at here, well, it's not obvious how different this play is here from the second master in the, oops, in the Largo section. And I'm calling this out right away because I want to, I, I don't want to step over the, um, the obvious comparison, right? It's not it's not clear when you look at it why this is different right now. There are lots of theories as to why. Right. And I'm, I'm not going to get into them tonight. Or I'm, I'm going to attempt to avoid them as much as I can, because we'll spend the whole night talking about right. it. Um, <laughs> but let's begin with the assumption that there is something different for the sake of our examination of Stretto. OK. And questions as to what makes these two different, 25VA from 28RA, the questions about what makes them different are, in my view, excellent questions, right? And they're, they're, they're worth asking. But we're going to begin with the, um, with the assumption that they are, in fact, different. And the first, or the, the two most obvious things I suspect we'll notice is one, the blade engagement, and two, the footedness. So the difference between 25 VA uh, and and 28 RA, 25 VA we have blade engagement roughly at the middle of the sword, or at least so the picture shows, but the text bears this out, right? This engagement looking like this isn't uh, possibly a mistake of the author. The text says here we are crossed at the middle of the sword in wide play and sure enough they are visibly crossed at the middle of the sword in wide play so you know that's sufficient evidence to for us to think that this is what was intended 
to be displayed, right? Cross in the middle in Y play. We also see their footedness, their feet are mirrored, right? So the master has his left foot forward and the, the, uh, the, the enemy has his right foot forward here. In 28 RA, we see something that looks maybe a little bit the same and something that looks different. The footedness has changed. The footedness of the master seems to be the reverse of what it was here. Here, the footedness was left foot forward, where the scholar was right foot forward. Here, the scholar seems to be uh, right foot forward, but the master is also right foot forward. So we colloquially call that matched footedness. Okay, The blade engagement seems roughly similar, right? So these guys are crossed at the middle, and these guys seem to be crossed at the middle, roughly speaking, okay? Which, of course, engenders the question, well, what's different? Is it just about the footedness? Is it about something else? Whatever. Um, and so um, why, okay, so without mentioning, without mentioning tempo, why I want this to be, uh, why this is important for us is that if this master sets up all these different plays, then it forces us to ask, what about this starting position lets us do all of these plays, right? What, a, what about this position causes all of these plays to follow, all right? That's a very important question. And the answer to that is, in my view, it doesn't. This is an archetypical play here. And just like we saw all the time in the dagger section, the reason why we do things is not because we want to do them, it's because the enemy tells us that they're to be done. The enemy makes an action, they, they, they cause an energy, which then presents us several options, and we choose one of them. Okay, so um, we're going to approach Stretto in, 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 in my uh, uh, guide through here with you guys. We're going to approach Stretto in the same way we approach Dagger. And that is, we're going to look at the plays and try to understand them. We're going to try and find the optimum scenario where we think they might play out. Rather than a scenario in, where, in which the scholar forces them to play out. Not to say that you can't do that, right? You you absolutely can cause things to happen in, in fencing. That's I'm not saying you can't do that. But just like with Dagger, Dagger, we were responding to specific energies where plays worked best in. So disarms tended to work best in a stay energy. A lot of keys tended to work best with a pullback energy. A lot of throws tended to work best with a push forward energy. Not that you couldn't mix and match them, not that you couldn't do a disarm with a pullback energy. It's not saying any of that. It's just noting where some of these plays work better and work worse for the sake of us doing them at full speed. So we're going to take the same attitude here. Okay? To can I interject? Yes, please. Okay. I would like to uh, make an observation that in your comparison between the second master of Largo, mm. the first master of Stretto, that the player, the Zugadore, against the master is making what common fencers do. In the Stretto mm. illustration of the first master, the player is in fact a scholar. So, a ah. scholar is not, a, not a common fencer, ah. someone who has some skill, and therefore you must be wary that they have at least some knowledge that the common fencer does not. Oh, shit, I totally and missed this that. Is, and this is something that a lot of people huh. completely miss because they always consider the master dealing with a common fencer. And in the struggle right. plays, we're starting out here with someone who's not a master, but is not a common fencer. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, the master must be more cautious and more precise. Mm-hmm. 
thank you for allowing me to interject that. Thank you, Kel. No, that's I, 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 I've never. I mean, obviously, I've looked at this a million times, but I've never seen that before. Holy shit! It is a scholar, isn't it? How how rare is that? Is that the first time we've ever seen this in a master? Well, in a master play, it may be in the Getty. In in yeah. the Navadi version, there are some mixed oh, up Oh yeah, that's true. That's on, that's true. Crowns, we think crowns are missing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Sometimes we think that there's a garter where it should be a zoo, but mm. you know that's yeah. just because we don't understand the circumstances of mm-hmm. the, the production of the Navadi that well. Mm-hmm. However, with the Getty, we know this is a presentation copy, or at least mm-hmm. a very very expensive copy of the original presentation copy mm-hmm. uh, to Niccolo. So. It's something to be observed. Absolutely. Please, please continue. Yeah. You're, on, you're on a roll. I wasn't sure right. where you were going, but now I do. Okay. Well, um, uh, thank you, Kel. That's, that, that is actually a fascinating detail, and it rolls into the last thing I was going to mention before we, we move on, and that is to draw your attention to um, this piece of text. Um, it's the only piece of text in the first play here that we've read that, you know, tells us anything that we didn't already know we have crossed our swords yes this is the crossing in which we make all the plays that follow okay that's evident the plays that follow you know will follow one another okay that's evident both of us could perform each of them holy shit what does this mean if you were to consider pardon me again yeah further to that Mm -hmm. thought um, if you were to consider the same plate or at least a similar plate in the Navadi, you'll find that they both have cro- uh, crowns. That's I'm right. They do it. And I could they, be wrong. No, that's, I believe that's the truth. That, I can find that out with a click. I believe so, that's exactly correct. So the, yes. The text here. And in the morning. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, well, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the Getty and the Morgan really mirror each other textually in each particular play. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the Novati has much much less information for us but the text of the getty and the morgan in this case substantiates that these two are masters so the illustration mm-hmm. in the body is not an outlier it's it's uh, it's a fact anyway yeah. sorry to sorry to, no not to, at all be, be sure you're there but i think it's important to look at the the uh relative uh strength the relative knowledge of the two players mm-hmm. being the master and the scholar or two masters at the beginning of the Shredo section that we do not see in the Largo section. That's right. That's continue. Yes, and uh, that's absolutely right. And and this is why I, I personally think this text here, small right. though it is, is so critical because it seems to suggest, I, I, I'm offering, it seems to suggest a window into the character of Stretto that is substantially different than Largo. When we talked about Largo, we talked about we talked about the logic of fencing. We talked about the logic of leader, follower, active tempos, attacker, defender, and how that can switch based on what kind of responses are given and blade engagements and all the rest of it, etc., etc., etc. Right? There was no there was no real talk about or at least we didn't get into it in Largo, about situations where both parties could be the actor. In a Largo situation, finding yourself where both parties could become the leader, (laughs) something's gone wrong, right? And that situation doesn't necessarily benefit either party. Right. If you're the le- if you're the leader, you're leading the actions and you're forcing the enemy to react because they have a care for their own life. If they do, of course. And in that logic of events, there is some safety. There's some control. There's some order. And as the defender, as long as you make your covers, every time you make a cover, you have the opportunity to switch that tempo and become the leader yourself. And in that sense in that logic there is some order and some some safety in a situation where both of us could do either thing both of us could perform each of them well that's much more akin to chaos than something that we've looked at previously right that is a very significant statement if true and and just like Cal said i find uh, as well the fact that this the pizzani dossi and morgan 
um, versions of this plate, both having crowns, I find it extremely uh, reflective of the nature of the text. Uh, and I didn't even notice this scholar band, but I mean, I, suppo I, I suppose I have to suffice myself with this scholar band. But my point is this, what this means here is that what we're looking at in Stretto is we're looking at a situation where lots of grappling actions can arise, but they're going to arise from specific circumstances, just like they, they do in the dagger. But they're arising in a context that at least Fiore seems to be saying there's no clear leader follower situation here necessarily. Both of us could perform each of them. The first actor is often, you know, advantage often comes to the first actor in this sort of scenario, okay? And without saying any more about it, what this means is that, you know, just like Cal said, this is a scenario where it requires a high degree of skill to manage safely, to be in control, not least to recognize what things can be done and what things can't be done. And this seems to be what Fiore is telling us in the first, uh, in the first folio the first uh, plate here. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Wouldn't be the first time I'd be accused of that, but there's my little introductory narrative. But enough about that. Enough, that's why. I know what? <laughs> you don't drink enough, that's why. That's right. I, I'm trying. I have a glass of wine in front of me right now. Um, all right. 28 RB, our first play in uh, Instaretto. Let's get into it. Uh, Connor, how's the audio this evening? It is raining, oh. so test, test, one, two, three. That sounds great. You sound good, then. Oh, yeah. That's surprising. The first play I execute derives from my master's crossing with his right foot forward. I pass with my left foot while going with my left hand over my right arm and grasping the handle of the opponent's sword between his hands. That is, in the middle of the hand. The grapple can be executed with a one or two-handed sword and at the crossing. The grapple can be executed both overhand and underhand. Thank you very much, Connor. All right. So um, here we go. 28 RB. So um, hmm. how do we do this? All right. Well, I'm going to take a brief second to offer one way of organizing these plays to you and then i'm going to tell you to probably ignore it because you're it's probably not going to be useful um on uh outside of the okay. south floor but i'm going to do it anyway just in case it is all right so uh oh no where's no oh, fuck. Oh, no no stop 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 go away all right here's a snip of Um, uh, here's a snip of a body. One might, if one wanted to, divide a human body into four quadrants. Upper left, upper right, lower left, and lower right. The um, common entering device in Stretto is the offhand. Okay? It's the left hand in cases of normal people. <laughs> 90% of people. Yeah, 90% of people. It's the left hand, all right? And the left hand is on the left side of the body, as we all know. So why is this? why does this matter? Well, two swords can be crossed at the middle and have a significantly different engagement between the two, depending on where the swords are crossed in relation to your center line okay so some of these plays that we're going to see work better when the thing when the target of the entry right when the target of the entry is in one of these four quadrants right it's in one of these four quadrants so that's that's how I understand them. I was introduced to this understanding of it, uh, of, of Stretto by Bow, and I, I, I like it. S seems pretty simple to me. 
but I'm going to be referring to this sort of thing as we uh, as we go. But I fully understand and recognize that this may be impossible to imagine uh, on the internet. So you know, it is it is what it is. Without an overhead view, it's very challenging. Indeed, With an overhead view, it's really yeah. clear. Yeah. Um, so so this play here, right? This play is he's grabbing the hilt of the sword, and it's not really clear to see, but this sword here is on the inside of the enemy's sword rather than on the outside okay oh wait no is that wrong or is that right on the wait, inside on. of the center it is on, it is on the inside yeah that's what i thought yeah that's right so uh so we're gonna we're gonna imagine we're gonna assume that all of these plays oh, that's not straddle all of these plays begin with two people being crossed like this as if let's just say they've both made fendentes with passing steps so the crossing is going to be true edge from your perspective as this as the scholar who's going to be doing the plays the tr your true edge is to your left right you're crossed um, with the true edge towards your left side and the enemy is crossed with the true edge towards their left side as well okay Aaron can I yeah can I just interrupt a bit please so I'm, I'm terribly sorry but no. I'm having trouble with this this business about enemy and scholar and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, can we can we just use Fiori's terms of bastard scholar and Zugadori? Or sure, Zug? sure. If that makes you more comfortable, uh, I have no can, problem. Yeah, it does because enemy can be a scholar, or in this in this case, the enemy to the master is the scholar. So if you simply say master right, and fair scholar, enough. it's very very clear. Sure, um, it's a little less uh, convoluted. Fair enough. Now that's uh, that's fair. No, no problem. So, um, so the uh, the Zugadori here. Uh, crossed with the scholar, they're crossed in the middle with the uh, true edge to their right. The scholar is going to be reaching either over or under their sword, so the text says. But this hilt is only going to appear if the crossing, if uh, the crossing is to the um, is on the left side, of where, yeah, of the scholar. So I want you to look at this diagram as if you are the person doing the play. And so what are you looking at? So if the crossing is a little to the left of your center line, then their hilt is going to be available. Their their grip is, is going to be available, right? Or it may be, right? It may be visible, right? And Fiori says you can you can do this over your sword or under the sword, showing that as long as the grip is available, it doesn't really matter whether or not the entry point is high uh, uh, or low. You can probably do this, so he says. So what we're looking at here is after the crossing, if you can see the grip, you can attack it directly with your left hand, um, either over your sword or coming under it. But if you do... You're not crossing your center line. This is the why I brought it. I brought all this up. As is so often the case with these plays, you're not actually crossing your center line to get to these places. You're, these are the things that are kind of directly in front of your left hand, right? These are the openings that are directly in front of your left hand, your left shoulder. And that's what makes them available. That's what makes them convenient, is you just have to basically reach out your your hand and uh, uh, and and, gra and grab the and grab the hilt. Okay, so can this you, can you stop mm -hmm. there for a second? Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Because these this has been quite a lot of talk and yeah, I've said a lot of, uh, discussion. Um, uh, I'm finding it a bit challenging to follow, and that's not because I'm drinking because I just started, but. Uh, Hey, uh, other people, please, scholars, uh, yeah, crews, anybody that has a question as to where where the hands are here, why would you grab under or over that sort of thing? Please step up and say so, because you know that helps us. Uh, well, specifically helps Aaron. I'm trying to help Aaron hmm. uh, explain this more clearly to you. Anyone, please, please step in. So, BD here. Uh, BD. A couple of quick points. Uh, and this reminds me of looking through the uh, uh, the Crimson Flower document you made a while back, Aaron, uh, mm -hmm. which incidentally might be another a topic for video sessions at some point. Um, 
looking at the different quadrants here in Guelph, or at least when I run classes, uh, a slightly different take on it, which corresponds to the, the quadrant, is closest weapon to closest target, as well mm. as moving in such a way that you continue to keep his weapon from hurting you. So there are times where you're overbound and you have to reach underneath, let's say, to push the elbow and do the double arm wrap while keeping your sword a contact on his sword contact while you complete the wrap. Other cases where you reach over top, for example, in this case, grabbing the hilt mm. or the cross guard grab, your weapon is still on his weapon while you reach over top and across. And then on the other side, right? If you're pushed, if they take the center and they're pushing through and then you go to the left with a pommel strike, you're yielding to the pressure and going to the open space. Uh, so some those are some mm. of the things that, uh, that just pop out from this conversation. Mm. Good observation. Very Thank nice. you, Beauty. Well, and, and particularly here, I would emphasize that um, not only is this way I'm kind of bumbling through not the only way of organizing the section, but there are other, lots of other ways that scholars have come up with over the years uh, to organize these these strato plays in a way that makes sense and is learnable. So don't feel compelled per se to you know understand it in any particular way. Just these are all ways that we're trying to simplify. <laughs> I mean, uh, funny enough, simplify what we're looking at. But anyways, I don't want to belabor the uh, the play. Um, it is just a grab to the hilt. Once you've grabbed it, then you have control over um, their sword as well as your own. Um, it's possible that you can free your sword here. It's also possible that you can use the whole structure to um, to continue the grapple. Okay. Um, he says explicitly he can he, he can strike him with a cut or a thrust from here. So never let it be said that Strato is always about Albarazari, that, that it's always about wrestling, strictly speaking. That's not true, right? We're wrestling with swords, but we can use them both. That could be a cut to the legs, like a tread through. Possibly. Yeah. Uh, this this also might be one where um, I'm not sure if it's this play, or it's another where you can um, you can bring the sword to left tail and free it and do a get a true edge cut underneath. Um, that might be a different play though. No, no, no. You uh, can is it do this it play? Here. Yeah. You can okay. do it from here mm -hmm. if his hands are high enough. Yeah. If his hands right. are low, say in breve, mm -hmm. and you've reached over your sword. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> to, uh, or, or sorry, reach over your sword to take control of it the way he is. Because if his hands are any lower than this, mm -hmm. it's it's impossible to do anything else. If his hands are higher and you're reaching under your sword to take it, it's a completely different story. Mm -hmm. You can still do the tread through sort of cut to the, the lower belly, but you can also wrench him forward. You can take a pass back with the left foot and wrench him forward off balance, therefore uh, pulling his head down, head and shoulders mm -hmm. down, and allowing a, a cut to the back of the head, uh, shoulders, arms, whatever. Either play can work because this is a, a moment of stabilization where you've changed the crossing of the blades to a crossing of a hand on the grip of the sword, or the handle of the sword. Mm -hmm. um, another another option here, which I have seen work, which I find incredibly risky is where you grasp the handle and are immediately unable to manipulate or stabilize the grip you slip your forward left foot a little bit out of the way and drop the point into his face over his right arm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not it, it's it's a pretty play but it's one of those things where your grapple didn't really work so now you've got an opportunity to thrust because typically when you grab someone's handle, they're going to try and retract it from your hand. That's right. And that places your opportunity on the other side of the center line. But anyways, we're, we're getting a little more convoluted here. This is yeah. very fancy, fancy stuff. It is. Um, though, you know, I, I would say that that's the nature of uh, Strato. Strato is no less fancy than Largo. I, I actually kind of find it a little more complex in, in its way. But... I don't know how many hundred of yeah. times I've said it. Largo's where you win the fight, Strato's where you survive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, all right. <clears throat> Any last questions about this one? Before I move on? Mm -hmm. Okay. We can always return to it, of course, if you, uh, if you think of something later. All right. The second scholar, 28RC, one of the classics that everybody remembers 
from Stretto. The first pommel strike. Um, can we have Graham? Would you like to read the text for us? Sure. Uh, it's the second edition. Uh, this is another play deriving from my master's crossing. As he is crossed, he can perform this as well as the other plays that follow. Grasp the opponent as shown and strike him in the face with your pommel. You can also cut a fendente to his head before he can make a quick parry. Thank you very much, Graham. All righty. So the pommel strike. Um, the one that comes after uh, this one is a double pommel strike, so it's going to have a similar uh, category. But this is, of course, a, a super classic, very fiore. And this is one that tends to happen in the upper left quadrant, uh, I would say. So when you have a crossing and the swords are pushing towards your right side across your center line, this necessarily opens up the upper left quadrant for you. So as your sword is, you know, your swords are sticky in the engagement, right? And so if they're pushing across the center line, your sword may be moving across the center line, but your hands aren't necessarily, right? Um, and so, you know, this, this allows you, the fact that you can stick onto a sword, you can, you can keep the contact, but move your hands, as we practice so often, it allows you to do something like this, where you keep contact with their blade, right? You, uh, you keep contact with their blade, but your hands swing up and enter into the upper left-hand quadrant to affect this, this play, whether or not it's single or double. Now, in this play, we see two things. We see the entry is actually done to the wrist with the left hand. So the, the scholar sees a wrist and he takes a wrist. And in the, in the entering, he's able to s suppress the, the sword and, of course, check the main sword hand so he knows where the sword is. Press his sword around, keeping in contact, and basically push that pommel right towards the guy's face and get this, um, get this nice pommel strike. And notably in the text, he says, one, you know, he, he, implying once I've got it, I can then proceed um, with a, uh, oops, I can then proceed with a um, uh, finente. Okay, any questions about this one? No? Cool. Yeah, it's um, it's a great one. It's a great one. And nobody ever has any problem remembering these two, these two pommel strikes. They're some of the most memorable, I find. They have a lot of trouble sorting out the situation between the two, but yeah, they, they, they stick in your mind because they're so cool. And, and if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> the two-handed one is where he says that knock four teeth out of your face. I, I hope so. I love that line. <laughs> um, well, and we'll see. We will see forsooth, sh shan't we? <laughs> Twenty-eight RD. Uh, Renat, would you like to read the text for us? Here's another pommel strike. You can do it at once, and if if his face is uncovered, do it without fear, since this strike is possible. Is, is possible both in and out of armor. With this strike, Fiore can make the opponent spit four teeth out of his mouth, since he has tried it. If you want, he can also whip your sword around his neck, and the student will perform next. <laughs> what an asshole. <laughs> I like this one. I call this one spitting. This one is spitting chiclets. <laughs> since he has tried it. What a flex. You, you didn't have to say that shit. He could have just left it. You could have just put a nice fat period, but no, you had to add. <laughs> it's just, oh man, it's too good. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> so here we go. Um, the double uh, pommel strike. Um, in in essence, uh, very similar to the play we just saw, um, though in uh, the actual doing, there's a bit of a difference. Um, very simply, this uh, double pommel strike because it is lacking the check to the wrist needs to be done with a much more sensitive, uh, with much more sensitive attention 
to the pressure in the engagement than the other one. With the other one, if you saw the wrist and you entered in onto the wrist, you could perhaps you know, open up the upper left-hand quadrant, even if it was ultimately only really open for you a teeny tiny bit. But this one, since you're not really checking the wrist, you have to be careful that you move in proportion to the enemy. So you're only going to get a chance to do the double pummel strike if you get pushed across the center line enough to get both those hands in there. Right to swing well, both those hands in, in there and and get it. More importantly, look at the feet. Where is the right. scholar? That's a big difference. Yeah, he's also way the hell on the outside. That's right. Not on the right. not only on the outside, but he's almost foot parallel with That's right. the Zugadori, because the Zugadori has pressed through the center so That's right. hard. That there's lots of room. I personally like right. to do this with the back of my right wrist against their right wrist mm -hmm. so that it makes that whole combination of blade and hand fly off across the center. I'm not trying to turn them like I would with a hand push or, or a mm -hmm. previous play or an elbow push in another play. But this particular one is I'm letting their energy glide mm -hmm. off my right arm so that I can attack them from that side. A lot of people try to jam the arm down and then get a double strike in and that conflates the two plays of the mm -hmm. single hand strike and the, and the double hand strike because they want that extra power of the double hand strike. Well, the power of the double hand strike is not you hitting them, it's them walking into your pommel. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, right? Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. This mm -hmm. is what we call good clean fun. <laughs> spitting, spitting chiclets. Because we've tried it. <laughs> oh, yeah. There, there, a lot of scholars have asshole. dents in the front of their mask just for this. That's right. Yes, they do. Many a mask has seen retirement for these, for, on these ones. That's right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, so these, these pummel strikes are, um, I would say they're the king of the upper left-hand quadrant. They're some of the most recognizable plays that we get to do here. They're fantastic. And not only do they work great per se... As a strato play, you know they they do cause pain, and we know from our um, our uh, examination of the wrestling section, the, the Abazari section, that pain compliance is a thing. It allows us to build tempo to complete actions that will actually end the fight. So doing a pummel strike, right, knocking out their teeth, it's pain compliance. It could end the fight, you know, in and of itself if the uh, Zogudori's constitution is extremely uh, uh, light. It might not end the fight if their constitution could sustain it, but it could lead to a tempo that could give you a fight ending action. But that fighting ending oh. action is not necessarily going to be a strato one. You could buy yourself enough tempo to actually leave and cut at Largo after this as well. So they're very powerful actions, both of, the, of these pommel strikes. right? Very versatile. The second pommel strike gives you such a large tempo because mm -hmm. unless someone has a head made of stone, mm -hmm. which, you know, you meet people like that once in a while, uh, but even then you're going to stun them enough that you can turn your sword over and do the, the blade grab against the neck. Uh, it's, it's a very solid follow-up to mm -hmm. a minor stun. If you've hit someone so hard that you reel them backwards, you can't put your sword to their neck because they're moving backwards. So, it is uh, a big difference between these two plays. Hmm. You can stun someone badly enough to whip your sword around their neck, as the next scholar will show. Mm -hmm. But whereas with the one-handed strike, it's like, bang, there you go. You're out of the sword fight now. I can grapple you. I can, yeah. you know, whatever, right? But in the two-handed strike, you are close. You have no sort of control over their sword. So you have to work from behind them to continue in safety yeah that is the safest thing absolutely absolutely and not least because you can you should never trust your enemy uh your excuse me you should never trust your your zucadori in any way whatsoever in my view no right I mean, they attacked you with a sword what kind of guy are they that's right um i bite my they thumb at you buying your wine they that's right buying your wine 
uh, you know, so even, you know, someone who has never done a spin cut in their life upon having the, the main four teeth of their face knocked out might just turn and do a spinning mezzani to you. <laughs> you so, you know, there's, uh, safety is, is absolutely gained from getting behind. Um, I think it's more likely they're going to cut, they're, they're going to try to cut up with a false edge towards your arm. Yeah. Or, or something like that for sure. Yeah. But yeah. Either way. Either way. Fuck them. <laughs> Next play. Let me introduce you to the ground. Ha ha. 28 VA. A play which um, shows some uh, variation in severity in these uh, in these responses here. Being uh, nice. He's using the flat. Yeah, even. Right? Look at that. Uh, all right. Andrew, would you like to read this text for us, please, sir? Okay, as the student said, through the previous play, I placed my sword around your neck. I can now easily cut your throat, since I see that you have zero for neck protection. <laughs> you forgot his gorget. Uh-oh. Well, he's in civilian clothes. One does not wear a gorget. He's in civilian <laughs> clothes. Indeed. <laughs> it's not a fashion state until the Renaissance, where they have a big ruff that looks like a, a bird yeah. that swallowed a plate. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, that is a funny it's always been a funny fashion um yeah all right so 28 28 va um we see a very logical um what could be understood as a logical continuation uh, from the pummel strike plays um so oh, i'm getting all turned around here <clears throat> excuse me normally i have the whole section up there we go. All right, so we've looked at this little hilt grab. We've looked at one pommel strike play, 28RC, another pommel strike play, 28RD, and then this sword to the neck play. Um, as, as Cal mentioned, and I, I follow him on this 100%, conventional wisdom is that this play follows from the pommel strike plays, right? Though um, you don't necessarily have to read it as following from the pommel strike plays, you know, all of these things happen where they happen, right? Even if they're presented um, in in a, in a series, just like we we talked about with the uh, uh, grappling section, right? Um, sometimes you know plays work where they work. So here's a here's a play here where we have the sword wrapped around the opponent's uh, neck. Now, obviously, you know it's we don't know how you got here. Except, of course, if we assume that we just saw uh, how we got here with these pommel strike plays, which is definitely one way to. So that's a very reasonable interpretation. But regardless, we got here, and instead of doing something else, Fury here has decided to throw the sword over the neck and threaten, well, threaten a bunch of things, right? He specifically says in the text that I can easily cut your throat since I have zero for neck armor, which is interesting uh, because since you have zero for neck armor, that text is interesting because this play is generally viewed as a play which shows that you can, you, know, you can scale back sometimes the force you're using, right? You don't have to kill the guy, right? You could, you know, hold him tight and whisper sweet nothings into his ear while he contemplates his existential place in the universe and why he decided to fuck with you. <laughs> but Fiore says in the text that you could cut his throat. Okay, so rather than say, l like I suggested a, a couple minutes ago, while uh, rather than having got these pommel strikes, create distance and maybe attempt to hit the um, the Zug in Largo. Maybe this is safer. Once you've gone into Stretto, is to stay here and finish it. And this is one way, it seems like Fiore is saying, that you could finish it. Throw your sword around their neck and um, use the use grapples that we know to cut their throat, right? Transitioning from frontale, which is what he is in uh, here, in the, in the abrazare posta frontale, transitioning from frontale to iron gate with a volta stabile, with, the, with the, his neck, his unarmored neck on the sword, would probably suffice to cut his throat or at least give him a bad day, right? Once he's on the ground, you can continue or leave, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So very interesting play possible to scale 
the violence, but also, of course, possible to continue the lethal force as well. Any questions about that one? Everybody dreams no? about getting to this play. Yeah, that's a that's a fight night ender. Everything yeah. that comes after that fight, uh, <laughs> everything that comes after that for you in the fight night will be worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, drop the mic and go have a beer. All right. Um, next play. All right, twenty-eight VB. Yeah, that looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? Um, BD, would you like to read this one for us, please? And thank you, sir. Of course. After I'm crossed, I pass with a parry and strike your arms in this manner. I also thrust at your face, and if I extend my left foot, I can bind both of your arms. Either this, or I can do the play after this, where I bind your sword by grasping it at the hilt. All right. So, <clears throat> strike the hands. So this is an interesting play. Um, I think, what do I, some plays are more obviously fit this little graph than others. I don't think I'm, well, I think, I think I usually articulate this as striking it on the inside rather than on the outside, not least because you see he's turned his sword up to prime to threaten the thrust in this, in this image. So, um, conventionally, I, I think I, I say that the entry is, probably on the right somehow probably not low it would probably be a little worse if it was low probably on the upper right uh, uh quadrant that would be that would be my my conventional take but what's interesting about this is that this play here as opposed to the ones we're about to see this play is actually something more like um this play is is something very temporary it's kind of like a a check or that that word check it's a word that gets thrown around sometimes um um in in the scholar circles it's as distinct a check is a distinct uh is distinct from like an entry where you're grabbing something a check right? is specifically in studies that's that's right a check is a temporary uh, a temporary entry as it were that isn't intended to to hold, grasp, fix something in time and place, which is which most entries do. A check is intended to disrupt, usually, um, uh, a position, or at least, if not disrupt, maybe hold something in time and place for the briefest of moments. Right? It's it's not intended to be robust. Right? Um, there's a bunch of things that we looked at in Dagger that could be considered checks, depending on your stylistic preferences. Um, this one is, uh, in, especially in comparison to the ones that follow this play here, is more like a check. So you've come to the engagement, right? You're crossed at the middle. You're the first actor. You have access to the inside of their of their sword, which means the engagement is probably pushed a little bit to your left. So you have access to his right side and probably his hands are middle to high ish. So your left hand is shot out and it's, it looks like on the back of his hand, right? He's, he's smashed into the hilt and hands of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, the Zugadori and simultaneously turned his sword up to threaten the thrust and in so doing he's gained tempo and now the zugadori is following and he is leading because if the zugadori does nothing he gets the thrust and he's cleared the sword from the center so there is nothing opposing the thrust right there's nothing so it, stop you. Please yeah stop you. please go ahead <clears throat> look at the foot in this uh, mm -hmm. You see how the toes are almost together? Mm -hmm. He has purposefully put him his his point of his body, not his point of his sword. He's put the point of his body at that which offends him. And that puts his entry 
because he placed his foot there, his hand was going on the same line. It puts his hand into the center where your cross is on the image on, right. The, on the right. It puts his hand into the center, whether he continues on from there for some kind of grab or just pushes the sword up, mm. or, you know, any number of hand contacts. This has an awful lot of similarity to the sword in one hand play yes. that we often call the slap. Yes, right? so absolutely. Where you, you struck with the back of your hand against his hand hilt combination mm -hmm. so that you can place your point in. It's, it's, very, it's very, very similar. In this particular configuration, however, he's put his hand in between the hands and the handle so that a number of options can be advantaged. Either of the wrists okay, is, hmm. is available or the handle itself. But the placement of the foot in the sword in one hand is back and ready to be changeable mm -hmm. in the sword in two hands in stretto there is no chance that it's going to be anything else than the control of the center line the sword the the uh, scholar's sword is up in finestra ready to deal with pressure or lack of pressure and put the point online but if his point is shoved offline by the strong of the Zugidori sword, he still has the options available in the handle and the hand combination. So there's a whole lot of variables available here, the best of which hmm. end with the Zugidori getting a poke in the face, the worst of which end with you grabbing their handle and shoving it down to the right as the scholar. So the scholar mm. will take in the handle and shove it to the right, and then just bring the point around with the cavets, right? Mm -hmm. um, this particular commitment, though, uh, you can see from the footwork, means there's none of this dancing around at distance. You're on it. Right, that's You're right. You're not leaving that center. And that's a critical difference from the sword in one hand. Sorry to digress, you may not have looked at that. Nope, um, that's, uh, I, uh, I was um, hoping to get there at some point. <laughs> so thank you for expediting it. Uh, absolutely, Kel. So uh, this, is, this is exactly as Kel said. This is reminiscent of this play, if not very, um, uh, very similar. The key difference, though, is that, um, as Kel said, unlike uh, the sword in one hand, where we we generally interpret Less these plays in, in Largo as a in, in a Largo setting, um, though there's no strict Largo stretto um, uh, categories given in the sword in one hand. Most of the of the plays in sword in one hand are generally have a Largo flavor. I would say that I agree that this one does. This one is not. This one is a, a close a close stretto play. So it gives you tons of options, right? Tons of options, and we're going to see those options uh, next. Okay. Uh, any uh, questions about this one? Hey, let's all join hands and contact the living. <laughs> they're they're um they're they're mystified by our um, impossible to divine explanations of martial arts all over the internet. That's just that's how it is. Yeah. I, I wish I wish it, I wish we were on the <laughs> wish we were on the south floor every time we come here. Yeah. But it is what yeah. it is. If it was terrible, we wouldn't be here at 18 sessions. <laughs> Someone would have said, God, please stop at session four. <laughs> or maybe they did and I just deleted their email. Never mind. Uh -huh. All right. Next next play. Hey, if it's any right, consolation. We can get Connor to get up at three in the morning to talk to us. That's right. That's right. I was going to say, if it's any consolation, it's, it makes sense to me, at least mostly. Yay. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Um, all right, this one I love this one. This is a neat one. Um, I love to do this at full speed. That would be sweet. Often tried, always failed, but it's a it's a doozy. It's pretty pretty sweet. Um, Twenty eight. The, hmm? the only person that has ever made this work against me was, hmm. uh, believe it or not, Ken Ronchi. No shit, really. It was my very first armored tournament, and I'd never even seen the play because I'd been with Emma for three ah. months. He did this to me, and it's never happened to me since. Wow. Well, look at that. Wonders never cease, Ken. But then again, as soon as he took my sword, I pulled his helmet off. So well. kind, of, kind of surprised. <laughs> All right. The uh, the sword grab, the, the snaky sword grab, 28 VC. Can we have a... The hilt grab. Bruce? The hilt, 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 hilt grab. What did I say? Sword grab. Hilt grab. Sword. 
Uh, Bruce, would you like to read the text for us, please? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Second edition. I am performing the grapple mentioned by the student before me, and now I can strike you without trouble. I'm holding the hilt of your sword, and I'll give you a generous portion of thrusts and cuts. This play breaks every disarm, and even the close play, as long as it's performed quickly. All right. Thank you very much, Bruce. Okay. So, um, this play is neat. We'll try and describe it. Um, but we'll note the text a little bit first. After we do this play, I'll give you a generous portion of cuts and thrusts. Again, underlining that um, strato does not mean you give up your sword and start punching the guy. Right? Swords are absolutely active in, uh, in strato, and by that I mean cutting and thrusting. It's very much a thing. So... Um, yeah, that's important to, 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 to remember. And I say that, of course, as much to anyone listening to this as to myself. This is something that I always uh, find re-emphasizing to myself. Uh, the last part is a little interesting and curious. This play breaks every disarm and even the close play, <gasps> as long as it's performed quickly. I think he's trying to say this play is pretty freaking good. <laughs> if you can do it, it's great. So, cool. What is it? He who gets there with the firstest with the mostest. Firstest with the mostest. So first, let's describe what it looks like, because it is much. It's pretty much what it looks like. You've gained, you've you've gained a sword grab. Uh, you you've grabbed the hilt like this on their sword, and your sword is now free. So you can do with it what you like. So cuts, thrust, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is this? I submit to you that this is not something cool and neat per se, as if we're seeing it for the first time. This is yeah. a boar's tooth. Nope. Or a middle or a middle key, if you it's if you prefer. Key. If middle you prefer. Key on the blade. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, on on the blade. So um, middle key, of course, we know from Fury's incessant repetition um, throughout the dagger section about the middle key. Constantly referring to the first scholar of the a first master of uh, dagger, folio 10 VC. He later describes yeah. it in the Polak section as the third key of Abrazari. Oh, really? Interesting. So, yeah. So let's let's mm -hmm. you go with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. So, which is this, of course, as we see, right? The middle key. Um. So where are we here? Yeah. So what what is this? It doesn't matter that this isn't an elbow. What matters is that we know what we're doing when we do this. If the situation is right, we have the ability to um, put our arm around the sword like this and grab the hilt of the sword so that the sword is now firmly in our power, fixed to our structure, um, effectively merged with our core, um, in a in a in a geometrical structure that's very difficult if impossible for the uh, enemy to uh, extricate right this the best thing for him to do if if this gets put on is either to jump on you or leave uh, as is, as is very that point. well and isn't that the isn't that the rub right um, if he fa if he fails to react qu quick enough to um, to uh, beat the point forward here then he's in he's in big trouble but this play is good now what scenario the last question is what scenario allows us to do this how the hell would we ever do it uh, my view is that this scenario works principally when you find for whatever reason the engagement to be something on the lower left side and this is because this works easily if you're able to come down on top of the enemy sword of the of the zukadori sword so if you can bring your arm down over the sword and then bend it at the elbow to bring it back up on the other side and grasping the hilt along with a little footwork little teeny footwork that can get you there as opposed to trying to snake it around 
if it's in one of the other quadrants, which I submit to you either works poorly or doesn't work at all, not least because it takes a lot of time. Because the problem with this one, of course, is that if you start to get your arm around, but you don't complete the grab, the sword can be pulled away. And depending on what gear and clothing you have, that could be more or less awful for you. So this is something that Maybe. you want to do. You want to you want to have it done as soon as it started. Uh, Hell, yes, Bruce. Can you explain what it was like, what the person who did it to you was doing, like how that happened? You were on. You okay. said you were on the receiving. Is that a question to me, Bruce? Yeah. A question to me, Bruce. Okay. Yes. Um, I was uh, thrusting from uh, Middle Iron Gate. So exactly the situation of coming up into the lower left quadrant of my Zugadori or my playmate. And uh, for some reason, he had learned this particular play. He is uh, a modern uh, epi type fencer like, like uh, Dave Ito is, but without the talent. And um, he had practiced this play against uh, Maestro Martinez. At the time, he was a student of Maestro Martinez. Uh, and he is, in, in fact, the only student ever of the Martinez Academy in 30 years that has been expelled. Um, this particular fellow managed to pull this play off because I'd never seen it before. And in fact, uh, none, uh, neither Brian nor Dave Savette had either uh, seen it before, aside from looking at it in the book. Because pre predominantly when we began Emma back in 2000, 2001, and, and when I joined anyways, they, they started earlier as generalists, but uh, we had the Pazani Dossi. We didn't have a good copy of the Getty. So we'd never really seen this play. And, uh, you know, Ken Pon pulled this one off of me. And um, unfortunately, he's not a wrestler. So I went from, oh, I don't have a sword, so I'm going to grab your head. And he didn't have a chin strap, so his helmet came off. The look on his face was mm, surprising. Uh, but literally, I took a thrust from middle iron gate towards his lower quadrant and he managed to do the wrap on it. I had at the time, the, the sword I was using was extremely long. Uh, some of you may have seen it as more of a, like it's got a vaguely Scottish claymore sort of cross on it. Mm. Uh, it's, it's quite a long sword. So I took a shot at him thinking that I'd be able to tag him in the hip and um, you know, didn't work out. And so he took that away and you know, According to the rules of, of that particular mini tournament, which was in 2011, six weeks after the attack in New York, they decided to mm. go on the event anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were only three of us, David Savet, myself, and Ken Monsheen. And Ken Monsheen had trained for uh, a couple of months in armor by having Master Martinez take a 10-foot staff and beat the living shit out of him all over the cell. So he really got good at dodging and, you know, getting control of whatever was trying to hit him. I have to compliment him on that, but as I said, in the 20 so years since, no one has ever done this to me again. I've done it to lots of other people. Okay. Yeah, and and uh, so that answers the question. It's coming from the lower it, left. Exactly that. It is as and as Aaron described. If that opportunity presents that, that quadrant, if if his hands are higher, if he's in an upper quadrant, you cannot do this play. Yeah, can't I've get seen over people it. People attempt mm -hmm. to do it mm -hmm. by reaching over, mm -hmm. like. Let's play um, in uh, in dagger. This play is normally done from a high position. Mm -hmm. up position. Uh, it doesn't work with the sword the same way. Mm -hmm. And 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 also with a spear, this works just as well. Mm -hmm. You can't grab the grip because uh, you know, there's no cross on a, on a spear. But you can put your arm over the spear and grab the haft of the spear with the palm of your hand, thumb forward, mm -hmm. and and you can get a, a, quite a good tug. So if someone's thrusting at you. And you do this wrap past the head of the spear, and it's not so great with poleaxe. If someone's thrusting at you with poleaxe, they're they're going to do some other horrible thing to you as well. Uh, but with spear, if you grasp it this way, you can draw the person that's thrusting at you overbalanced onto their forward foot, and it works perfectly well. It's just a slightly different grab because in this case, the palm is still forward, the thumb is up, grabbing mm. the, grabbing the hilt. But if you you know, you know pronate your hand a little bit. Uh, your left hand will palm down onto the half, and you can get a pretty serious bit of friction on that, even in armor. It's never shown in the in the in 
manuscripts uh, in any sort, but I can guarantee you, mm. I can teach you it in five seconds. Yeah, and once you uh, once you have this grip, then um, as with many grapples, uh, many if not all grapples to the sword or that involve the blade of the sword, once you have it, you ought not worry about being cut, right? Um, no. Your 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 uh, the tightness of the, your grab. The inside of yeah, your arm makes it is fine. against the flat of their blade. Yeah. The flat of their blade and the point are back along your yeah. uh, scapula. There's no nothing to cut you, and you're wearing a zuccarello. I mean, like we often yeah. practice this in t-shirts, right? Mm -hmm. Which is medieval underwear. But you know, people say, "Oh, you'll get cut." Well, no. In the zuccarello, this kind of play, you're not going to get cut at no. all unless you lose your grip. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and hey, and good, very good question, Bruce. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. And this is also one that the, the fact that the optimum place for it is the lower left quadrant I'm, I'm maintain. This is a little counterintuitive, again, because the middle key that we've seen before is against something that is upper left, right? Uh, in, the, in the dagger section, we're looking at something. We're looking at a middle key classically coming from a, a response to a pullback to a mandrito attack. And the entry point is going to be... In this diagram, it's going to be something upper left. So it's like, well, of course, why wouldn't it work here? It doesn't. You have to be on top. You have to get on top of the sword. You get your hand down and then bring it up in order to, to do it. At least so it would seem. Um, yeah. All right. Doesn't work any other way. I've tried it and mm. tried it. Ah, all right. My uh, was this this next two plays are some of my favorites in uh, in Stretto. They're just the freaking best. They're the best. So let's read them both together in the same breath. Uh, Connor, would you like to do us the honor of reading these ones? 28 VD. And V and 29 RA. Yeah, Strato goes fast. There's not yeah. a lot of it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. When I am crossed, I enter into close pull. The hilt with your hands. Lift up your arms and your sword. I will now throw my left arm over your arms, left, and strike your arms while your sword under. And I'll continue okay. striking until I get tired. Okay, um, I'm going to reread it for you because you're breaking up there, Connor. Uh, my fault. No, 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 no. I'm sure it's a technical connection. You're happening around the world, brother. Okay, second edition. When I am crossed, I enter into close play. I put my hilt between your hands, and I lift up your arms and your sword on high. I will now throw my left arm over your arms to my left and strike your arms while I have your sword under my left arm, and I'll continue striking until I get tired. The student's play that follows is my play, the one I want to do to you. This is a, a really critical play uh, that tests the hand protection that we play very mm -hmm. very rarely does this come out in free play uh to this extent and it, if you had the basically suede gloves that fiore describes of his uh, five encounters with the juparello and and the gloves of a female sheep gloves made from the skin of a female sheep this would suck rocks. Like sure. you have broken fingers. Um, with the, the equipment that we typically wear in our hands, it's pretty hard to pull this play off. What you end up doing is kind of shoving the arm sideways. Uh, for the very longest time, I believe that shoving the hands not high but sideways was much more effective and, and easier to play with. But uh, until uh, it was pointed out to me that in both the Morgan and the Getty, the text is the same that you put the arms high. Mm -hmm. Well, that changes how you make your entry because instead of making your entry over top of his arms with the step, you can end up beside the Zucadori or, or parallel footed to the Zucadori, but you don't end up in this place where the footedness is really critical to showing you where the center line is. If it, you uh, do you want to read the next step, one, uh, Kel? Yeah, okay, sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's all right. All right. 
I'm finishing the play of the previous student by doing what he said. I put your arms in the middle of bind. My sword is your prisoner, or your sword is my prisoner, and I cannot help you. And no, I'm sorry. Let me try that again. I have put your arms in a middle bind. Your sword is my prisoner and cannot help you. While mine, I can strike you in many ways. I can all place my sword to your neck and immediately do the play that follows. I'd like to go back to yeah. the physical entry because it is, it's a card trick. It's somewhat difficult. Most common thing that happens in common fencing. If you were to watch, for example, SEA sword players do this who are not allowed to grapple, they always shove the sword crosses into each other's crosses and try to drive them up high and then clear them and sweep low to the ribs or the leg or whatever. Um, it, it's something that I dealt with for like 23 years because I typically fought with what you would call great sword or a spadone or sort of thing and this particular play if i had known it and been allowed to do it i probably would have been thrown out of the sca because it would work every single time hmm. and yet be against the rules of grappling this play demands that you force someone's hands out of the way by pain compliance and then enter and wrap with your left hand very quickly behind the horse, as it were, to the right. It's a play that I love dearly. And, and, and those of you that have suffered it at my hands, well, I apologize. You have learned to dodge it. You know, it is a really <laughs> cool play. And, and, and once you get the sequence of events, it's a domino. It's a domino effect. You do one thing, the next thing becomes available. Do that thing, the next thing becomes available. And in three steps, you have control of their arms. And it's a middle mm -hmm. key on both arms, mm -hmm. and not on the wrist per se, but on the forearms. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's got it in this place. He's got it fairly deep. It looks like he's on the elbows. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I've never gotten that far. No, never, never, never once. It's always on the forearms. Mm -hmm. But even then, when you pinch it up, I did it to an SCA person who was extremely talented fighter, but didn't didn't know anything about wrestling. Uh, I did it to this person, and I was on his wrist, and he literally screamed hmm. because he had never had his wrist squeezed that way in his entire life. And the guy was, you know, I was in forty mid forties or so, and the guy was in his late 50s i had been fighting for 40 some years where i'd been fighting for 30, 25 30 years i did this to him and he was in shock when we were talking about it afterwards he says man i don't want to do what you guys do that's crazy shit fury it's a good thing we're all crazy then Aaron, uh yeah please continue sorry for the digression. no not at all so um um so i second everything that kel said um my um the way I, I tend to think of this in, with respect to the graph is, um, you know, even if the engagement is neutral in the exact middle of everything, not too high, not too low, not too right, not too left, this is an example of something that you can make happen, right? Never let it be said that I, you know, I, you know, you, you should always do what the enemy tells you to do unless you get a chance to force your will right and this is an interesting situation where we do see the leader forcing their will on the engagement and saying i want this to happen and i'm doing this thing now obviously if it's countered then it's countered you do something else but you are causing this to occur and as kel said it's a three-step process and how i would articulate this is that you're coming into the uh, you're coming under the hilt uh, in, into the hands, causing maximum pain compliance if possible, of the enemy. You're coming under there, into it, and you're forcing the hands to the upper left side. And remember, this graph, this chart here, I'm. Uh, uh, it, this this graph here is us looking at the enemy, right? It's us looking at the enemy. So we're forcing their hands from, let's say, a neutral position 
towards the upper left, which opens up. It opens up the whole right side, but it specifically opens up the upper right side. Okay, and this allows us to put our left hand right right into the upper left quadrant. Uh, sorry, the upper right quadrant, and bring it down on the wrists, on the hand uh, on the hands and forearms that we forced up. And with a bit of footwork, we can then sink it in a similar way that we kind of we'd end up sinking the uh, the sword wrap. We'd sink it, and then it would give us this position, this double middle key, which is kind of absurd if you think about it, how good this is. But this comes from a very reasonable place. It's not, you know, it's a it's a trick, but it's not super mystical. It's, you know, if someone's really insisting this middle position, well, fuck them, jam your hilt into their hands, force it up to the upper left, throw that left hand entry on top of their arms, and sink down and suck the, those two elbows in, right? And you can absolutely get this, right? And this isn't, but you know, this is another example of how important sometimes pain compliance is. And, you know, if we're fencing in a SAL environment, which is relatively respectful about pain compliance, you know, it's not something that we throw in all the time, then getting your hands munched to cause this play is not gonna be very common right uh, in our in our normal fight nights and whatnot so this is, is a possible reason why we sometimes don't see this come up um very I'll, often i'll make a comment i'll make a comment there is it doesn't come up too often because we know better well there's that too <laughs> there's that too but it yeah. also when it does happen yeah i don't believe there is a scholar that's been around for more than a month after winning his prize his mm. or her prize that will continue trying to struggle from this position they no. recognize the futility of it because we do train people to do this we've done this play off yeah. enough that people go oh boy i made a big boo-boo let's not make it worse by struggling because struggling really makes it worse yeah uh, i've seen brian pommel uh up another uh, scholar who didn't give up they kept fighting in this position literally pommeled them to his ground on his <laughs> because the guy just wouldn't stop. He was being foolish and playing games. Um, I've never had to do that for some reason, fortunately. But uh, this particular play is a signature play of Fiori that mm -hmm. you will not find in any other manuscript for the next 600 years. This is the only thing close to this is in MS-133, which is almost a century before Fiori. Yeah, at and least. Yeah. almost identical play to this mm -hmm. in the sword and buckler. That's right. That's right. There is, yeah. Yeah, that's also a double, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and he's in, a, it's funny, he's in a, this is, this is roughly speaking what half sword, or what that thrust slash half sword position is kind of, looks like too. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. No. Oh, no? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, uh, not wanting to divulge into debates about I-33. Um, yeah, so um, this is a great play. Um, you know, it's not something that's new. We know what um, middle keys are, um, you know, but it's applied here with all of our tools, right? Sword, pain compliance, um, you know, footwork that matches the tempo of our actions and it turns out to be awesome and and great and gives fury that little sassy remark i get to hit you until i'm tired etc cetera, etc cetera. and we're also going to see uh another uh place my sword around your neck situation um any questions about about these two plays no cool the okay. This play is quite controversial, so I'm looking forward to see other people's. Yeah, yeah. So let's um let's deal with this. Um, <laughs> that's right. It is absolutely. Oh God, it all just came rushing back to me now. Uh, I've oh, I've hated this one so much. All right. Twenty nine R B. Twenty nine R B. This one's a doozy. 
Um, or who who read last? I forget. I it, did. You did. You did, Cal. Okay, great. Uh, Renat, would you like to read the text for yeah. us, please? Thank you, sir. This play comes from the previous one. After the student has finished striking the opponent while holding his arms and sword while bound with his left arm, he throws his sword to the opponent's neck and places him in the position. If I throw him to the ground, the play is completed. All right. Thank you very much, Renat. So um, let's um, let's look let's look at it at face value, and then let's um, uh, have some fun and maybe speculate about the controversy. Okay. So in face value, this play seems fairly simple in that it's uh, by text and by um, the logic of the image a um, simple continuation of the two plays that we just saw previous. So he's yeah. he's hitting him until he's tired right he's hitting him until he's tired and then he says after the student has finished striking the opponent while holding the arms and his sword well bound he throws his um, sword around the neck of the opponent and places him in this position and if he throws him to the ground the play is completed as if <laughs> it wasn't complete here <laughs> but okay fine great so we can throw the sword around the neck and we can put him to the ground so in that sense it's not it's not super weird, but there are questions that the image presents us with. Um, one main question, and please, Cal, add, add the questions here. Uh, I just want to list the questions and then get into them. One main Let's question with is feet. with feet. Okay, so how the hell did we get here, right? That's question number one from from here, right? Now, he, maybe he seems a little on the on the outside and he's on the outside. Okay, maybe, but he's on the outside of the back leg here. Right? What? Right? This is the lead leg. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. But I now all of a sudden, leg get over there. The guy's leg is what? So that's question number one. Yeah. Question number two. He's still holding the sword. Huh? But what? Uh. But what? But how did the sword get? But how? But he's. Yeah. But how did? But what? He's still holding the sword. Page. Are we missing a page here? What's huh? going on? Right. Question number three. Isn't the sword supposed to be over his neck? Doesn't that seem kind of like it's like on his neck on the near side that he just kind of like put it on his neck rather than over it? Wouldn't it be on the other side of his neck if you couldn't see it? What is that supposed to mean? So <laughs> those are the big three, I, I would say. So if you look at if you read the text and look at the image, it's not obvious necessarily what happened here and the allegation in the text that this play is following from the previous one doesn't necessarily make it clear to us how you do this from this play so as kel asked uh, uh kel do you and have anything to add anybody else if you're, un yeah, if you're mm -hmm. uncomfortable with how confusing this is feel more comfort from the knowledge that enormous gigantic amounts of bandwidth <laughs> have been chewed up over the last 20 years yeah. describing or trying to comprehend the progression from the previous play to this play. Mm -hmm. If this confuses you, you are not alone. Yeah, in good company. Does anybody have anything to add about this one? Or maybe any any theories? Right? BD here. Please. <clears throat> the uh, yeah, this this only looks to me like something that would come from an elbow push from, let's say, a, a one-handed pommel strike. So mm. trying to tie this to the previous play, as as both of you have uh, play, uh, mentioned, it boggles the mind, right? Mm. Um, if you'd been able to do it with so much pain that he drops the sword, and then you use your left hand to push his ah. right elbow around, mm -hmm. that's one thing. But yeah, dragging a sharp sword across your body as you turn him around, that doesn't make any sense. As... Uh, the whole idea of pushing his arms above your head and stepping behind him while he stays in the same position. Again, it's, it's nonsensical. So, uh, so yeah, mm. those are the only comments I have. Yeah. I'm, I'm mystified exactly in the same way as you BD. The, the conventional sort of wisdom would be, well, all you have to do to get here is just to push the middle key uh, structure through the center. And then you're behind the guy and okay you can do whatever the hell you want but the problem is he's holding the sword and you know and y y you've you've controlled that whole structure okay but 
what if you hit him until you were tired and he dropped the sword? Okay, maybe, maybe that would work, except that in the picture he's still holding the fucking thing. Now, if you're in armor and you don't care about that sharp weapon scratching your, your armor as you push force out of those arms across your body. Mm. Never, mentioned. never it's mentioned. It's also never mentioned. Yeah. Also never mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Good try, though. What? No, no, honestly. Current, uh, let us say, word of Brian on this is that you do exactly that. You beat him till he's tired. Mm. His sword kind of drops loosely and floppily. And then you turn him through the center. Right. And, you know, then you're beside him and you can do whatever you want. Right. The problem is a sharp sword going past bullet holes. Yeah. Right? Unless that sword is absolutely yeah. soft in the hands, you're still dragging a sharp edge across two legs. So... I have issues with that particular mm. um, interpretation, but as I say, that is the current word of Brian, and it's the best thing I've heard so far because none of the others over 20 years have ever been able to explain this. If you are pushing him through, his sword is down low, saying like a vaguely stupid, oh, let me see, like the vaguely stupid uh, mm. middle iron gate over the right leg thing. Mm, mm, mm. Then, if you take your foot out, left foot out, yeah, yeah. shove it through, yeah. and then step behind him again, like regain your footing, as mm. it were. So, sort of a, I don't know, a skip step, like you sure, like a shuffle or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. Or shuffle or yeah. Something. So, if you do that, you can make it work. Uh, we went through this when uh, Kimmy was trying to figure out how to do this stuff. Uh, to go teach at a conference or you know, hmm. one of your, it was one of the scholar things that you organized, the scholar presentation. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to figure this out, and I said, look, I don't know how to do this. I've, I've never figured out. Brian said, oh, it's simple. You do this. <laughs> and and to which said, I said, here, Brian, take this sharp sword and do it. <laughs> to which he said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so, yeah. in my mind, this is still an ongoing conflict, mm -hmm. but... This particular interpretation has been picked up by a few people that I have some respect for, or more than a little respect for in some cases, whereas the vast majority of people that I have no respect for, like Colin Hatcher, go, can't do it, it's wrong. So, this is a very interesting point scholastically, mm. that the transitions between these two plays is not clearly established yeah it's not I obvious at all personally i personally have played with it enormously and if you don't swing your foot around if you don't change feet it doesn't happen if you change feet it makes perfect sense but if you don't change feet it doesn't happen go back to the previous play please mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. see left foot forward next play right foot forward yeah there's an element of footwork that's not defined that we have to infer from the images of the Getty, because this is not in the Morgan, as far as I know. Oh, and, I don't uh, believe so. Yeah, PD, let me just check. I don't believe it is. I believe in the PD has not been interpreted. No, it's unique. This one is is unique in the family. And yeah, you know, the, the, the footwork you mentioned, I mean, you know, we are, we're actually moving through Strato at a decent rate uh, this week, but you know, what makes it work is the footwork, you know, and it's the one thing we can't really, the Strato footwork is often pretty subtle. You know, it's not just simple as, you know, you increase here, you pass to here. It's not so necessarily obvious as Largo. Um, it can be really s small and subtle and it's, almost impossible to really talk about usefully on the internet. So you have to, our, you know, if our understanding of structure, yeah. our fortitudo is not strong from the Abrazari section, mm -hmm. it's impossible Absolutely. to work this one out. Yeah. And as I say, like this is something that was presented to me maybe two, three years ago, and I have enormous skepticism about it, but 
I have even greater a skepticism about every other interpretation of it. I think most of them mm -hmm. are utterly fantastical and perhaps uh, drug-induced. Uh, <laughs> this particular one has a possibility to be worked out if you can only figure out the dance move. And it Indeed. is a specifically a dance move. Yeah. So, there you yeah. go. For those of you that are studying this and going, whoa, mm -hmm. you're right. It's really, really yeah. messed up. And uh, please, continue. Like, think about it. Play with it. Find, mm -hmm. a, find a playmate to work it out with. Scholars, try to play it out and see if you can make this thing work for you. Because this is one of those... 1% things that's still left in the interpretation that there's no real agreement on. Yeah. Um, we all agree that, yeah, having a sort of tense your neck would suck rocks, but how do you get to this position from that previous plate? Yep. Anyways, my take. Thanks very much. Yep. Nope. I thank you oh, very much, Kel. Anybody open. else? Uh... Soapbox is open for someone else. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So let's let's oh. get maybe. Oh, sorry, BD, please. Oh, please, yeah. please. oh, oh Graham. Graham, go ahead. Oh, it's Graham. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just so not really an interpretation of it, but I'm just wondering what. So the sword, he's doing a throw, and he's throwing him over. Sorry, the scholar is throwing the Zogador over his right leg. So it seems or sort of like a cross he, guard. He's checked his right leg mm -hmm. while he's cutting it, and he can right, also okay. hook the hilt into his throat, his esophagus under his chin. He can hook that and throw him onto his back. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, this is a, a classic judo type throw, like. Right. But, cool. Uh, I think that the element here is you've swatted this guy in the face enough that he's seeing bird, Tweety Birds, mm -hmm. and you can shove the sword through somehow without getting either of your legs cut. Yeah. And exactly. uh, and then you can hurl them over. I mean, the the beginning mm -hmm. and the ending are very clear. The how between, not so much. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. It. No. Oh, so. If he's not threatening you with the sword, why you have to do this crazy finishing move? Oh, right. yeah. Well, the, the <laughs> what do you mean, why? <laughs> you've, you've, beaten the, you've beaten the snot out of the guy with the pommel of your sword until you exactly. got to the point where, well, I've had enough of this crap. Or, oh, here, here's someone new trying to threaten me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, this is not only right. judicial combat. That's right. This is, or, or, or uh, you mm -hmm. know, dueling or whatever. A lot of people like to think of it that way. Who are not Fioris, by the way. Um, this this particular play can be interpreted as: I hate your guts. You tried to kill me with a sword. Now I'm going to tear you apart and leave your bleeding corpse on the ground. Or it can be interpreted as: Lucky a bumpkin. Just because you have a sword doesn't mean you know how to use a sword. And that's the way I kind of look at it, because I find an awful lot of uh, Fiori's admonitions, like people say he's, you know, overconfident or, you know, bombastic or whatever. It's a simple matter of, no, nah, Buckwheat, that doesn't work. No, no, no. See, I've been doing this for a really long time. And what you're, te what you're trying to do is, I've already seen it. So there's a a great deal of that because in the getty he says i've been doing this stuff for 40 years if i've done that much mm -hmm. study uh in three other uh arts and sciences i'd already be a doctor of each and yet i consider myself a good master I'm sort of thinking people have paid me well so i must be a good master this this kind of attitude of i can mess you up in 90 different ways because well i've done it you know, I know how to do this. I've seen things. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to show you things that don't work. So my confidence in what he's instructing is extremely high as a scholar of mm -hmm. this art. But how he gets from A to B here? Mm -hmm. I got no man. Yeah. <laughs> this is a what's yeah. that? <laughs> so for those of you that are scholars or those of you that want to be scholars, play with this one. Look at this one as yeah, the community still got work to do in this. We haven't we haven't a hundred percent. Yeah, and, and the it's been a really beautiful thing to look at. And the next time you find yourself at a at an Emma party where there's a bit of a lull in the conversation, loudly get up and declare uh, <laughs> an opinion about this play. That would be excellent. And, yeah, and and make uh, sure that everybody yeah. has a drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and make sure nobody has anything sharp. <laughs> That's right. Nobody that you practice with has sharp. 
I'll give the sharps to other people and say they're going to show you my interpretation. All right. <laughs> um, okay, let's do maybe let's. Ah, um, oh, you know what? Let's end it there. We're at 9.57, and let's open this up to questions or comments about what we've talked about so far. We've gone through the first bunch of plays, right? One, one two, three, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's not bad for a night. We've gone through almost... A good bit of work. Yeah, so broadly speaking... Any questions? Any questions about Stretto, um, about Aaron? anything we've talked about? Yes, Bruce. Okay, that last one? Mm-hmm. Putting it together... I think there's two steps between the first image and the second image between that one and the one beside it mm -hmm. in that he has said in both times that he's beaten this person over the head with his sword. Mm -hmm. So if he smacked him in the head several times, mm -hmm. this person is probably punchy. And if he lets the sword, if he's, if he steps back, let me see the Zugador Mm -hmm. steps back with his right leg mm -hmm. takes a step back and the arms slide out the Zugador still reeling from having been pummeled then takes a second step back with his left foot that would then create an, and his sword he's again punchy his sword is probably down that would create enough space that he could safely move the sword off to the other side. That is Brian. Step in. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, it the, would the, depend uh, absolutely yeah. on the Zugador being pummeled severely in the face with a, with an iron bar. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think the, 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 the uh, without, it's the only you know, way I can see. Yeah. But without speaking for everyone, I think the one thing that most people agree on most about, this one way or the other is that the there's been a, hel a, a, a healthy uh, helping of pummel strikes between these two plays. Um, you know, this play has happened. He's hit, he's hit him a bunch, and then this play has happened. So there's room to wiggle, you know, through through the different ways of, of thinking about it. But yeah, that you're describing roughly Brian's view uh, there, Bruce. Roughly, I think uh, roughly yeah. exactly. Yeah. Brian's view is that there's enough, there's enough uh, discombobulation in the Zug that you can do this double step. It's chain step. So by passing, okay, we're going to look at from A A R A, a twenty nine R A to twenty nine R B. Twenty nine R A, you pummel the guy, pummel the guy, pummel the guy, and then as the scholar, you take a step back with your left foot, pass the arms down and through. Because at this point, mm -hmm. you're barely having to hold on to the guy's mm -hmm. arms. He's, mm -hmm. you know, he's a punching bag. Mm -hmm. So you pass the legs through. Your leg comes out of the way. There's a, just enough space for a barely moving sword to slide through. It's probably not going to cut through regular woolen hosing. If anything, it might hit a flat, you don't know. Yeah, exactly. But no, then, and, and then when you step back in to hook them up, you're going to move your right foot in such a way that it goes around the Zugadori's right heel so you can get behind his calf. And this is a common throw that we saw mm -hmm. in, um, in the dagger section with the extended uh, sort of mezzano attack instead of a proper mandrito attack. Of, uh, uh, with the dagger from the right side um, it, where you get your leg behind the guy hook him up with your arm what we like to call the clothesline yeah let's right? oh it's right here there it is right there yeah we That's like to right. call the clothesline but see how the leg position is yeah um okay. here we go so in this particular thing we you 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 put your foot in there like you, you know that your foot wasn't there you didn't drag him forward onto it you put your foot in there. So the footwork exists outside of the sword play. It's not something new. So there's a fair fair amount of real realisticness. No, no, uh, reality mm -hmm. uh, in that particular set of footwork. And remember, never give a sword to someone who can't dance. So someone right. who's playing with swords has got some ability on their feet. 
and it's also a, a you know not politically correct view these days but in the middle ages people that were lame were considered crippled like like really not worthy um, and simply not that they weren't a human being with a brain and all that but they couldn't do all the functions required of a human being like they couldn't do the things that a gentleman could do a gentleman could dance a gentleman could ride someone who was crippled in one leg could ride no problem but once they were off the horse they were not a full man and it's a hard thing for modern people to wrap our heads around uh, because we don't we don't really well we try not to uh, think poorly of the handicapped someone who's, who's just got a bad knee and I got two of them I mean watching me walk around the cell many of you people have probably gone what the hell is this guy even doing here um, there there's so much of the medieval psyche that's hard for modern people to wrap our heads around so the idea that you can move your feet quickly and accurately is a given not a wow mm -hmm. that's cool it's a given yeah so if you can't flip your head around that particular reality of the context this is a very challenging play and i have to agree i've struggled with it for a very long time and uh, the, the current interpretation that we use at emma mm -hmm. and and i and i'm gonna put that in terms of i don't always agree with brian this is one where I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, even though he can't do it. Neither of us can. And if we can't do it, if any of you can, awesome. Please yeah. do it. Show us how. It's a, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. It's very challenging. Uh, but it's and, also something that, like, like you said, this is, this is a, 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 um, I'm glad you brought this up, Kel. This is, all, you know, further evidence that what we're looking at here, what we've seen this whole time, in this section so far isn't really new there isn't really anything yeah. that we haven't seen before the mechanics of which we don't already understand it's just putting put together in a way that you know on the surface seems might seem unique or different or interesting it's a new shuffle of the cards yeah and but you know th uh, th this seems like a kind of a dumb point but it's it's critically important for practitioners in my view because it, despite our efforts there still is a natural sort of mental category barrier between wrestling dagger and sword you know and it, and sometimes it's it's difficult you have to spend energy to will yourself to believe that the wrestling and the dagger you know is this thing here while holding yeah. the sword you have to will yourself to believe it because for some somehow it's not obvious to your body because we're right? We are attuned literarily to look at chapter progression yeah. in literature. Yeah. Whereas this is not chapter progression, it's layer progression. That's like right. Like adding layers to an onion. Or if you've ever made candy apples or dip candles, there's another one. Mm -hmm. If you ever made candles by hand, this art makes a lot more sense to you because you start with a wick, you add more wax to it or tallow or whatever mm -hmm. to uh, stiffen it and, and draw it out into its current shape until you get it to the point where it is what you need it to be yeah. not that there's a specific type of candle it's you have a given amount of materials to work with you make the best candle you can with the situation yeah. and for anyone who has ever dipped tallow candles as opposed to beeswax beeswax is like working the finest clay you could possibly use whereas dipping tallow is like trying to paint on with mud it, it it's something that if you don't have exactly the right temperature it melts the damn candle every time you dick it in and, and if you have it too cool then it creates these big kludgy lumps tallow is really hard to work with and yet tallow was like 99 percent of the candles ever made in history so if you don't know what tallow means then really go and find out about candle uh, it's a simple task it was something that people needed every day and where people and as a side a, a side thing say people oh you can make 
leather armor by dipping it in wax. Well, no, you couldn't because you, the, the leather and your time was so cheap compared to the value of the beeswax. They had specific monks in cathedrals that were designated to spend all their time picking up the wax tailings from the beeswax so that people wouldn't steal it because it was so valuable. Beeswax burns clear with almost no smoke. Tallow is stinky and smoky. You have to keep messing around with the wick to keep the thing lit to a useful degree. And this is something that even children could manage. Yeah, and so, so like like Kel said, this is it a, a it's it's a layered approach. Absolutely. Um, and you know, and and just as a as a something final to say tonight. You know, having said that, and even acknowledging it mentally, is uh, is one thing, but it's keeping this in mind, of course, for when we get back onto the cell floor, which is, of course, the real purpose of this course. It's not just in order to spend time together and study the manuscript, of course, while we're not on the cell floor. It's so that we can take these things onto the floor when we're actually back doing this thing that we that we love. It's, you know, feeling, it's feeling that relatedness of grappling dagger sword all together, all at once. That's what we're going for. And not least because the rest of the book depends on it. Because, oh. it, you know, if, you know, if, if Stretto, if it's true in any way that what I said, that Stretto is a kind of a culmination of everything that we've looked at so far. Um, oh, that's the dagger section. <laughs> if strato is the culmination of kind of everything we've looked at so far then once we get into armor now we're further culminating everything but adding we're culminating things and adding more on like just as kel said we we're dipping the beeswax candle again and adding in a whole nother layer um in this case a layer of steel and menace <laughs> so um and, these and, th uh, yeah and, and indifference too yeah because absolutely well, the comment that he makes early on about, you know, in the, in the introduction stuff about, I would rather fight three three times mm -hmm. in armor in tournament than to fight once with sharp swords, mm -hmm. because I can take many blows and yet win the day, mm -hmm. whereas with one blow, the sharp sword can take one. Yeah, that's a great line. Something I love that line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because having fought in armor for a really, really long time, there's an awful lot of crap that I would put up with in armor because I've always, I originally trained as if I were in armor, even though I was wearing what would be considered very light armor. I just didn't care about getting hit. And it was something that Brian pointed out to me really, really early on. It's like, how much you want to suck up? You know, like how much you want to suck up out of armor? And that, he said, well, you're taking all these punches and stuff like you know, as if you were in armor. But yeah. when in armor, there's an awful lot of things that you can tolerate as into incidental hits that you could never tolerate in just as you were mm -hmm. gloves, like like chamois. Like, like we think of chamois as a little rag that you wash your car with. It's the same material, it's tanned the same way, but it's about 10% mm, of the thickness of normal chamois. If you look at the kind of winter driving gloves that are made of beigey suede, if you take the, the lining out of it, that's about the thickness of a sheepskin glove. And sheepskin gloves were very popular. They're not particularly waterproof, but they're super comfortable. And after they've been dampened a couple times, they mm. fit you like a... A glove? Well, like your skin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, like a glove, yeah. yeah. Like your skin. You know, the, the old trick of getting a pair of blue jeans, taking a couple baths, and they get you fit you properly. Well, like, I guess not many of you, that's more of um, it's It's an idea that if you want something to be conformative to you and to suit you and to show off your figure, your, your physique, as it were, and that's a huge thing for these guys. Like, <sighs> presentation was enormous they were they were what we would call like jersey shore guidos you know these guys were all about 
looking good because you got your position in society by looking good and doing good. You did not advance in society because you had a degree from uh, Bologna. <laughs> you survived in society because you had a degree from Bologna and you couldn't do anything else. If you were a competent military person, even if you were only good at physically fighting like Zabusiko was, Zabusiko was the complete jackass uh, punk, is the only way to describe his exploits through his life. And yet he was one of the most revered 14th and early 15th century personalities because of his accomplishments and his daring. Right? Do, I, do I have Ariella's thesis on here? I might. Ariella's, uh, the, Ariella's thesis on the Busico? Yeah. I don't think she, she wrote an article on it. Or Basically, an article. Oh, it was an article, an, yeah. She, she wrote an article on the, uh, on the anonymous uh, exploitation poem uh, saying that this is this great guy and this is he fought against the brother yeah. of the great Busico. And yet, you know, other major Fiori academics don't accept it. Because they want to believe that that Fiori student uh, Catania actually mm -hmm. fought the Marshal Busico. He didn't. He fought his loudmouth brother, oh, and I that's think, been yeah. proven, right? Not only by her work, but the simple fact that Busico, and they both call themselves Busico. The father go. was Busico. The uh, the older brother. Uh, was Busico, but Jeffrey the Younger also called himself Busico the Younger or the Busico or a Busico. And when you look back on that and trace it through, and I've spent a lot of time on it because I really want to prove Greg Bailey wrong, is Busico um, Jeffrey was in Northern Italy creating problems and could have easily attended these particular fights, whereas his brother, Jean Lemanger, the older, Jean II, was in North Africa at the time. Now, how do you get from North Africa to fight a duel in Northern Italy when you're on campaign with the Duke of Burgundy? Can't be done. Duh. Okay, this, this is not related to our studies, but it's it's one of these things where academic studies are very important because people get wrapped up in oh he fought the Busico, the the Marshal of France, the the great uh, yeah. you know supposed leader at uh, Agincourt. No, 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 no. He fought his loudmouth brother. Yeah, I put also I, a pain in the ass. I put a link to that article, and you'll find the link to part two in that in that link as well. I put a link in the uh, in the chat yeah, cool. for anyone who's interested cool. in that in that story. So, so for um, those of you that have suffered my uh, my uh, incessant comments tonight on Cor Aaron's uh, lesson plan, I appreciate your your patience, and I appreciate Aaron's patience. I'm trying to oh, my be pleasure. helpful, and uh, I really enjoy these sessions, especially since more and more of you are, are uh, coming out to play. Uh, I miss you all, and uh, I wish I could be with you, and hopefully within a year I may be again. But well. for now, if, if uh, you know, my side comments help you continue with your interest in these studies and perhaps open your mind to a slightly different view on the context of, of Fiori's time, um, then I'm just overjoyed. Thank you so much, and thank you, Aaron, for allowing me to comment on this stuff. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, with that, thank you all very much for coming, as always. It's always great to have you. Um, this video will be up um, within a few days, I hope, and um, we'll see you guys uh, at this same time next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Yep. Thanks, Aaron and Kel. Have a great evening, everybody. Good night, Aaron. Good night, Good night. guys. Good night, guys.